Recording in progress. Chapter nine, institutional pharmacy practice. We'll skip over the terms and definitions right now, but we will cover them throughout the chapter. Probably one of the most challenging settings in which a pharmacy technician can work in is a hospital. We also call it institutional pharmacy. The dynamics of this environment can be exhilarating, exhausting, and definitely depends on the circumstances. One other thing about hospital pharmacies is they more than likely pay higher. There's more chances for advancement or other jobs within the hospital. Um, but starting in community pharmacy is totally okay. So because there are a few hospital pharmacies um, than community pharmacy, there are fewer job openings for pharmacy technicians and hospitals. However, as a result of the current changes in the pharmacist role in hospitals, the number of highly skilled technicians needed has increased. Pharmacists once prepared all intravenous antibiotics, chemotherapy drugs, and large volume parental medications, in addition to other inpatient tasks. Because of the increase in patient volume and the need for pharmacy interventions and evaluations as they pertain to patient profiles, today's pharmacists do not have the time to perform many of these important tasks that they used to be able to do in the past. So technicians have assumed control of these tasks, which include preparing IV medications, loading patient medication drawers, or PIXIS machines, and also entering patient data into the pharmacy computer system. Depending on the function of the hospital, patient populations vary. The size of a hospital may be thought of in terms of the number of beds available for patient use. Many small cities or towns have small facilities with the capacity of 50 beds or fewer. Larger urban areas have facilities that can range from 50 to more than 250 beds. There are profit and nonprofit hospitals. A nonprofit is a facility that does not pay either state or local property taxes or federal income taxes because it is considered a charity. Nonprofit organizations must meet certain criteria established by state and federal guidelines. A for-profit or investor-owned hospital is a facility owned by private investors or owned publicly by shareholders. For-profit hospitals issue shares of stock to raise funds for the expansion of hospital activities. Another important difference between hospitals is the organization of the pharmacies. Many older hospitals have one central inpatient pharmacy that is responsible for supplying the entire hospital and all clinics. Larger hospitals and those with specialized areas may have a central pharmacy as well as, well as smaller satellite pharmacies throughout the facility. For instance, a large teaching facility may have specialized areas of treatment such as pediatrics, burn units, intensive care units, investigational drugs, surgery, or cancer units. Because of the large volume and specialty of the medications needed for these areas, these units may have small pharmacies that stock specific medications in both bulk and unit dose packaging. This practice can accelerate the distribution of commonly used medications and allow the pharmacists to work directly with physicians, nurses, and patients on an individual basis to address specific medical problems. Hospitals are funded by various entities, health insurance companies and Medicare pay for services in many institutions. Others are funded by donations. Other institutions are managed completely by the government like the VA hospital. Table 9.1 lists examples of various sizes and types of hospitals. So you can kind of read through those and look and see. Hospitals are incorporating satellite pharmacies to expedite order preparation and delivery. Specialty medications can be stocked in these pharmacies for oncology, pediatrics, and intensive care. Satellites are small specialty pharmacies that supply a clinic such as the emergency department or an entire floor of a hospital. Most of the floor stock used by the satellites is supplied by the hospital's large central 
pharmacy. The pharmacist's role is to monitor regulatory compliance and oversee all medications dispensed from the particular satellite to ensure optimal patient care. A pharmacist working in a satellite facility must have a thorough knowledge of all medications used in that specialty. Technicians who work in the satellites are responsible for filling all medication orders and delivering them to the nurse's station. Other duties include answering phones, keeping satellites stocked, filling stat orders, preparing IV medications, replacing missing doses, and replenishing pharmacy stock. Many hospitals have a discharge in or outpatient pharmacy that fills prescriptions in the same manner as a community pharmacy, except that it is located in the institution. Physicians' orders are written on special discharge order form forms that are sent to the pharmacy with other orders via a fax machine or a pneumatic tube or delivery by staff. Nowadays, too, um, the prescriptions are being e-scribed from up on the floor down to the outpatient pharmacy. Other hospitals have designated pharmacies where patients can pick up their discharge medication. The discharge orders may be sent via the hospital computer to the outpatient pharmacy for filling. Once a discharge order has been sent, the pharmacy fills the order by the same process used in the community pharmacy. This includes using your address, phone number, insurance. So one thing that is kind of newer in hospitals too, um, like a meds to beds program you for discharge patients. So meaning if you are being discharged from the hospital, say you're being discharged on five new medications, um, the hospital that I worked at and I did this job for a little bit. So we would check to make sure the medications that they are sending you home with are covered. That's first and foremost. If they're not, then we work with a doctor and the nursing staff to get that changed. So that eliminates the patient going to another pharmacy and being told, hey, this drug is not covered. No one knew that. And now they are out of the hospital. They don't have the drug they need. And um, you will find out when you work in pharmacy, if you work in retail and you have to call a hospital, it's really hard to find that specific person within the hospital. So um, you could be, the patient could be trying to get a hold of people themselves just because you can't. So the discharge program is really nice for that. So we would check to make sure everything's covered. Then we would fill it using their insurance. And then we had a little um, tablet that we would check them out on in their room. Um, or they could stop by the pharmacy on their way out of the hospital and pick up their medications. Um, but more than likely, more often than likely, we brought them to the room and the patient had them when they left. So kind of cool. So all pharmacies have policies and procedures manual, also known as standard operating procedures. This manual contains the policies and the rules of the facility and the procedures that explain how, when, and or why the policies are to be executed. In other words, the protocol of the facility. For example, information contained in the PMP manual concerns daily work routines and responsibilities, benefits, protocols for emergency situations, mandatory training, and other important and useful information. Technicians should be familiar with the PMP manual for their facility. Protocol also defines the guidelines within the hospital, such as the formulary medication, those that are approved for use, and non-formulary medications, those that are not approved for use. Formularies are developed by a group of physicians and pharmacists from a variety of medical spe specialities who do not work for the entity requiring the formulary. These group members review new and current medications to evaluate selections based on the cost, effectiveness, and safety of the drugs and patient demographics. These rules must be enforced and updated constantly. The Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, composed of pharmacists, physicians, nurses, and other healthcare workers and administrators, they meet on a routine basis to discuss appropriate changes to the protocol. The purpose of the committee is to choose the best medication for patients at the best cost. So one thing about the hospitals, you could be taking um, one medication and it's not on their formulary. So they're going to give you another medication within that same class um, if it's on their formulary, just while you're there. 
So just a little tech note, the abbreviation NKA means no known allergies and NKDA means no known drug allergies. So if you work in a hospital, you will see that sign up quite a bit by patients' rooms. Um, and then I think some of hospitals have them on their wrist sometimes. So the pharmacy staff probably works more with nurses than with anyone else in the hospital. Nurses are the pharmacy's primary customers and should be given the highest level of support. They depend on the pharmacy for all of their medications. They generally are responsible for more than 80% of the total calls or electronic contacts with the inpatient pharmacy. The subject of these inquiries include the status of their patient's medication and requests for information about drug interactions, dosing ranges, and pharmacy calculations. By far, the most common question asked of the pharmacy is, where are the medications I ordered? Any pharmacy technician can answer this question by simply accessing the computer system to see whether the medication was sent or by checking the orders that have not been entered. The technician can also check the automated dispensing system to see whether the stock is empty. This can be done from the main pharmacy ADS machine. All other questions should be referred to the pharmacist. So just an important little reminder, collaboration between nurses and pharmacy is important to ensure that medication errors are prevented. Teamwork opens channels of communication and improves patient care. So depending on what you do in the hospital, you're going to work with um, nurses quite a bit. They are usually kind of overworked and they work long shifts. So sometimes they can be a little short, um, but remember that we always need to be professional no matter what. Um, they could be having a very stressful day. Who knows? But we have to take it for what it's for and um, just always be respectful. You're going to have to work with them forever, um, so you just have to kind of get used to it. All hospitals must meet federal and state guidelines if they are to be reimbursed for patients who have Medicaid or Medicare insurance coverage. Various agencies, such as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, ensure that hospitals meet all standards of safe operation. So we have some agencies that govern or offer voluntary accreditations for the operations of hospitals. The Joint Commission is an independent nonprofit organization that offers special certifications and accreditations to organize, organizations willing to go through a process and pay a fee for certifications or accreditation to show quality and patient safety. The Joint Commission surveyors visited accredited healthcare organizations a minimum of once every 39 months or two years for laboratories to evaluate standards of compliance. This visit is called a survey and all accreditation surveys are unannounced. The Joint Commission can require compliance with applicable local rules and regulations so it can indirectly enforce USP guidelines in states that have adopted USP in their pharmacy rules and regulations. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This agency was formerly known as the Healthcare Financing Administration. It regulates and administers Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act standards, and several other health-related programs. The CMS inspects facilities and must give approval for hospitals to provide care and receive reimbursement for patients covered by Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is the primary agency that protects the health of the American people and provides essential, essential human services. <clears throat> the Department of Public Health, each state's DPH inspects hospitals and hospital pharmacies to ensure that they are in compliance with DPH regulations. The State Board of Pharmacy develops, implements, and enforces pharmacy practice standards in the state for the purpose of protecting the public. A medication order is a prescription written for administration in a hospital or institutional setting. So in the retail world, we get prescriptions. In the hospital world, we call them medication orders. The order is written on physician's order sheet and is placed in the patient's chart. 
The chart is a record that contains all the medical orders written by medical staff, along with nursing assessments and notes, medication administration records, laboratory results, and all other vital information about the patient's admission. The chart remains in the patient care area where the patient is admitted. The unit clerk or nurse periodically checks all records for new orders that must be sent to various areas of the hospital. Some hospital pharmacies are not open 24 hours a day on weekends or holidays, whereas others are open all day, 365 days of the year. For those that are not staffed by pharmacy personnel at all times, contingent policies and regulations allow specific nursing personnel to have limited inpatient pharmacy access to obtain needed medications in other facilities and on-call pharmacists may provide the necessary services in times of less than full operation. Still, other facilities may have off-site pharmacies that provide cure services to deliver needed orders. And that's more than likely going to be in small town pharmacies or very small um, pharmacies. <clears throat> so various methods are used to send orders to the pharmacy in the hospital. Computerized Physician Order Entry, CPOE, is a new technology by which the medication order is sent electronically to the pharmacy. Another method is pneumatic tube system, which allows a person to send orders and other small items by way of an air propelled tube. So like the same thing that they have at the bank. In this system, the canisters can carry IV bags and other medications to the hospital floor. A disadvantage of the system, though, is that the carrier can get jammed or the item can accidentally be sent to the incorrect department. Also, fragile items, controlled substances, expensive medications, and protein-derived medications require special packaging to be safely sent via the pneumatic tube because they can break during the ride. So here's like a tube station. Most computer systems allow pharmacy technicians to enter the patient's medical record number and drug orders. In many hospitals, the pharmacist enters the order because if the information is entered by the technician, it must be checked by the pharmacist to ensure accuracy before a label is released. Many pharmacists believe that the work is doubled if the technician enters an order and then the pharmacist must reread and approve the order. After an order is signed off, a printer produces a label that has the patient's name, medical record number, which we say MRN number quite a bit, or MRN, room number, along with the medication information, the name of the drug, strength, dosage form, route of administration, dose, quantity, and dosing intervals are included on the printed label. Because the labels are produced continuously, the technician usually pulls them off the printer and fills the order from the unit dose pick station. A variety of medication and dosage forms is always kept in stock for starter doses and for medications not stocked in the ADS. To make sure the technician retrieves the correct medication, a barcoding system must be used. The technician uses a handheld device to scan the medication's national drug code to verify that the correct medication has been selected. Medication orders that must be filled within minutes are referred to as stat orders. When the pharmacy receives a stat order, it should take precedence over all other orders. Normally, a stat order can be filled in less than 10 minutes, depending on the preparation time required for the medication. An ASAP order is not normally as urgent as a stat order. However, these orders should be put in front of new orders to ensure fast processing by the pharmacist. Standing orders are written pr procedures for drugs or treatments that are to be used in a specific situation. For example, if a procedure is to be performed, a pre-printed order with a list of medications to be administered is on file for the physician to use. This saves the physician from having to write the same order each time he or she performs the procedure. These may also be used in surgery cases to allow for medications to be removed from the automated medication dispensing systems while the patient is in the OR. Standing orders can include orders for PRN drugs that can be given in case the patient needs additional medication. Although CPOE technology is still new and not used in every hospital, 
which uh, this book is a little bit old, so I'm pretty sure every hospital is probably using it now. It is becoming more popular because it eliminates the need to decipher a physician's handwriting and the order is sent safely to the pharmacy for processing via computer entry. With the use of CPOE, the amount of errors is reduced as medication orders can be clearly identified and the computer systems check new medications against current medications for interactions or contraindications. If an interaction is possible, the computer shows an alert icon on the screen and the order cannot proceed until the problem is solved. <clears throat> Nurses are now electronically connected to the pharmacy through the use of barcodes. The nurse can ensure accuracy of medication dosages at the patient's bedside before any medications are given. Each unit dose medication is barcoded and can be scanned with a handheld device. Information is linked to pharmacy and to electronic medication record administration record, which we call EMAR. If there are any discrepancy between the current orders and the medication set for the patient, it is detected by the scanner and the nurse is alerted to the specific problem. The nurse's ability to verify dosages at the patient's bedside helps ensure that the five rights of medication safety are followed, which are right person, right dose, right time, right drug, and right route. And that reduces the time required for charting and creates less paperwork so the nurse can spend more time attending to the patients. CADM systems detect and monitor adverse drug events. Although pharmacy has used this type of system for years, it is now being integrated into the CPOE and EHR systems. This allows for a more comprehensive healthcare practice. Pharmacy technicians must have many skills in today's pharmacy because the roles of pharmacists are continually expanding, so must the roles of the pharmacy technician. Because pharmacists now have interaction with the proper dosing of medications and implement implementation of formularies, the pharmacy technician completes many of the daily tasks that were previously delegated to the pharmacist. So, kind of talked about that already. So we have job descriptions for institutional pharmacy technicians. So chemotherapy, they prepare cytotoxic agents and other medications that may accompany these agents. Controlled substances, gathers all controlled substance inventory sheets from all areas of the hospital. Technician also may fill and deliver all controlled substances. Pharmacist is required to verify pharmacy inventory daily. Discharge pharmacy fills prescription orders as patients are discharged from the hospital. Filling requisition fills all requisitions sent to the pharmacy, stacks inventory, orders pharmacy stack, controls narcotics inventory, and audits narcotics if required. Inventory orders all medications and supplies for the pharmacy. The IV room prepares all parental IV medications, including large volume drips and parental nutrition, prepares drugs that are under investigational trial and logs these special medications in appropriate manner as required by law. Medication reconciliation reviews and documents patient's arrival, medication, assuring appropriate dose, route, frequency, and duration of therapy. They may review records for drug-drug interactions, duplication, and drug allergy interactions, and they assist with arrival of medication order entry, participate in hospital communities relevant to practice area. Miscellaneous duties like answering the phone, train new technicians, um, work on a team with other technicians, clerks, and pharmacists. Um, patient medication fills medication drawers on a pharmacy cart that will deliver filled medication to all hospital patients. Preparation of medication, filling unit dose bulk medications, compound drugs or ointments, creams, and solutions. Then the satellite pharmacy, they may be responsible for all tasks related to a small isolated pharmacy, such as answering the phone, ordering, and putting away stuff. Preparing parental medications, transcribing, and pulling all medication orders. In addition to the previously outlined tasks that the technicians commonly perform, there are other duties that require the skills of a technician. Some hospitals that have nuclear medication pharmacies are used 
using technicians to prepare these medications. These agents may be used in diagnostic procedures. Some hospitals employ investigational drug technicians. An investigational drug is an agent that has not yet been approved by the FDA. After a drug has finished pre-human testing, and if the results are positive, the next phase involves testing with human volunteers. The drug company must apply for permission through the FDA. The application is referred to as an investigational new drug application. The FDA must approve the use through clinical trials of an investigational drug to ensure that the patient would not be exposed to high risk. If the drug is approved, patients can apply to participate in a clinical trial. Under certain circumstances, the clinical trial may be performed in the hospital. So the investigational drug technician assists in preparing, maintaining, monitoring, and auditing investigational drug study agents and related pharmacy documentation. Once the study is complete, the remaining drugs are returned to the sponsor along with the log record. Copies of the records are kept by the pharmacy under closed studies. A longstanding daily task of pharmacy technicians is loading the patient cassette drawers from a pick station. These stations in the pharmacy can be quite extensive depending on the hospital's needs. All the unit dose medications are arranged in order by generic name and are located in sections that separate solid, oral, liquid, suppositories, and other miscellaneous types of medication containers. Excuse me. Even though PIC stations can hold many medications, some patients may require medications that must be taken from the normal stock area, such as injectable dosage forms. After a new order is received, a starter dose is sent to the floor. The medications that will be needed for the next day are loaded in the patient cassette drawer. The technician reads the daily medication record printed each morning and fills the necessary medications into the cassettes. These cassettes are held in large push carts so they can be delivered to the various floors each day. All medications are delivered to the patient's floor using two carts that are rotated daily. Before the patient's drawers are loaded with the next 24 hour supply, all previous medications are emptied from the drawer. This is done to reduce the possibility of errors. Many hospitals use a combination of patient cassette drawers and an ADS. Commonly used medications are stacked in the automated machines where specialty or uncommon medication are loaded in the cassettes. One type of automated system used by large hospital pharmacies is the robot dispensing machine. It uses mechanical arms to scan barcodes on each unit dose medication to identify the correct dose. Although some hospitals still use patient cassettes, the patient cassette system only, most facilities are now using ADS and robotics. An example of an automated medication dispensing system is the Pixis Med Station 4000. This automated system uses a biometric user identification security system. This means the user's fingerprint is scanned and verified before the system grants the user access. Many automated systems similar to the Pixis Med Station system rely on passwords or identification swipe cards to control access. So here's a picture of that. After obtaining access to the station, the nurse selects the patient from, for whom he or she wants to obtain medication by touching the name of the patient and the name of the medication on the display screen. Then the appropriate drawer with the medication opens. When the drawer is closed, the amount of medication removed is recorded for inventory tracking purposes. The pharmacy can generate reports that identified who accessed the station, when the station was accessed, which medications were removed, and how much of each medication was supposedly removed. This information is valuable in solving discrepancies and managing inventory. Many hospitals have incorporated automated dispensing machines to hold all types of stock. These containers are available in many different sizes from countertop models to six foot tall cabinets that hold tubing, large volume IVs and dressings. The three main advantages of this type of cabinet are as follows, inventory control, reduced wait time and accuracy. So um, box 9.1 lists manufacturers of automated dispensing machines, and here are their websites if you want to take a look at any of those. 
Another important daily task that we perform is the preparation of unit dose medications that are not available from the manufacturer or stocked by the pharmacy. Although many pre-made UD containers are available for manufacturers, not all drugs are available in that form. In other cases, the hospital may prefer to make its own unit dose packaging because it can be less expensive and the hospital can make specific amounts to reduce waste. Technicians are responsible for determining which medications need to be made based on the use of stock by patients, documenting all necessary information per, per protocol, and preparing those doses. The final check is done by the pharmacist. Both bottles of medication are pulled from stock shelves and made into unit dose oral syringes and other dosage forms. Many different types of methods and machines can aid in the preparation of unit dosing medications. Only medications used on a regular basis are made into unit doses. For uncommon medication orders or unusual strengths, the technician must prepare individual dosages as the patient's needs arise. In the past, bulk liquid items were sent to the floor for several days use. For example, if the physician ordered Mylanta 15 ml five times daily, the pharmacy would send an eight ounce bottle that would stay in the farm patient's floor until empty. This minimized the need to place several UD cups in a small cassette drawer as a result of new standards implemented to reduce drug errors. The TJC now requires hospital to make all medications specific to the patient's dose. This means that every liquid dose must be prepared in a unit dose package and labeled before it is sent to the patient's room. A hospital may have a separate room dedication to the preparation of all oral liquid medications and may use oral syringes to pre prepare each dose. Other pharmacies may make up their own UD cups from their bulk stock. This would be done by a technician following repackaging guidelines. The task of counting, dispensing, and tracking controlled substances is a critical job that requires perfection. Many hospitals use pharmacy technicians to restock and fill narcotics for the entire hospital. In each hospital unit that stocks controlled substances, two nurses must conduct an actual count before the beginning of each shift. Therefore, all controlled substances are counted two to three times daily, depending on the length of a nursing shift. One nurse counts the controlled substance while the other nurse confirms the count on the controlled substance sheet or on the ADS record. If the narcotics are documented on paper, the count is transferred to a new inventory sheet each morning and the last day sheet is sent to the pharmacy for filling. Periodic automated replenishment levels are written at the top of the controlled substance sheets, identifying the amounts of medications that should be kept on the floor at all times. Often the technician is responsible for retrieving these sheets daily from all units and beginning assessment of how many controlled substances of various sizes and strength must be provided to keep the unit at its par level. At certain intervals throughout the day, IV labels re representing all current orders are printed from the computer system. All changes in IV medication information are kept updated by the technician and the pharmacist who work in the IV room. Only specially trained and properly garbed pharmacy personnel are allowed into the clean room. Normally, while the technician labels all pre-made IV antibiotics and other IV medications, the pharmacist answers the phone and enters new and changed orders. Orders in an inpatient pharmacy are affected by the time of day. For example, in the early morning, several preoperative medications may be ordered, and later in the morning, postoperative medications may be ordered for surgical patients. Also, more diagnostic exams are performed in the morning or afternoon hours rather than the evening. Medications that are required for these diagnostic tests usually must be sent by the pharmacy. A septic technique is a set of guidelines and procedures used to prevent the contamination of an object by microorganisms. Use of this technique is important in the preparation of all IV medications, IV nutrition solutions, chemotherapy products, and compounding ophthalmic medications. An IV technician is responsible for preparing various parenteral medications. Parenteral medications bypass the digestive system and are intended for quick systemic action. Parenteral medications are given by injection via the intramuscular or IV route. <laughs> 
This includes piggyback antibiotics, large volume solutions, and other parental medication orders. Some hospital pharmacies are responsible only for the large volumes of IV medications that must be prepared with special additives. The nurses on the floor maintain a floor stock of pre-made large volume bags that can be supplied by central supply or by the pharmacy. Typical antibiotics and other IV mixtures can be prepared in a horizontal laminar flow hood after the proper personal cleansing procedures and garbing order have been followed. And we have that procedure listed here in 9.1. IV preparation areas are required to have a clean room outside of the compounding area that meets federal standards. These clean rooms buffer the IV admixture room and allow preparation of IV labels and stock to be maintained in a clean yet separate area. They also must meet USP standards. Only the necessary supplies should be carried into the buffer room and the room must be clean with specific cleaning solutions and devices. Horizontal laminar air flowed hoods are cabinets that direct filtered air horizontally toward the opening of the cabinet, which provides a sterile environment for preparing parental medications. There are other types of hoods, such as partially covered vertical hoods and biological safety cabinets. So here's a horizontal laminar flow hood. Mm -hmm. A horizontal flow hood is used for preparing non-hazardous IV medications. A high efficiency particulate air filter is located at the back of the hood. When the technician is working inside the horizontal flow hood, the orientation of the hands must not block the flow of first air. First air is the air issuing directly from the HEPA filter. This means the hands cannot be moved between the vial, needle, or IV bag and the first air. Blocking the flow of first air can allow contamination of the preparation. The hospital pharmacy technician may be responsible for preparing chemotherapeutic medications. The same aseptic technician techniques are used in preventing contamination when preparing any parental medication. However, a few differences between the IV and chemotherapy environment should be noted. All chemotherapy compounds are prepared with a vertical flow hood, BSC, glove box, or compounding aseptic contain containment isolator. USP regulations state that the compounding should take place in an international standard organization, class A or better clean room. There are different levels of clean room. The ISO ranks clean rooms as ISO class one, the cleanest, through ISO class nine. The lower the ISO rating, the cleaner the environment. Contamination is measured by part particle count. HEPA filters capturing the contaminated particles and an ISO class eight environment means that the filter captures 3,520,000 parts per cubic meter that measure greater than 0 0.5 micrograms. There also must be an anti-room anti -room for gowning and degowning and movement of personnel into and out of the clean room. Additionally, a hood known as the primary engineering control providing an ISO class five or better environment must be used to perform compounding activities. There are different classes of glove boxes, but they are all based on the same principle that all medication preparation is performed in a closed sterile environment. Glove boxes have been found to reduce the possibility of contamination, which is a major concern in air prevention. So you just stick your hands right in there and you work with, you know, in there. Glove boxes can be used for higher risk IV admixtures per regulations. Air is filtered through a HEPA filter and then through a final HEPA filter before it is exhausted to the outside of the facility. The technician never directly contacts the medication while manipulating it in the hood. This is a closed system, unlike the partially shut shielded vertical flow hood or horizontal flow hood. Hazardous IV preparations follow USP 800 guidelines in some facilities and can be made by robotic, robotic systems such as Cytocare. BSCs are partially open front vertical airflow hoods used to prepare chemotherapeutic agents. The chemotherapy hood does not allow the air to leave the container compartment. Instead, the air is recycled through a second HEPA filter that removes any particulate matter before the air is recirculated into the work environment. 
The flow of air vertically helps protect the person preparing the agents from unwanted exposure. So there's a biological safety cabinet with vertical flow hood. The proper placement of labels is important to ensure visibility of the parental solution and contents. All labels must be placed squarely onto the medication and should be clear and easy to read. The technician must initial all medications, even if the label is placed on a pre-made bag. Before IV piggy mix and drips are delivered to the appropriate floors, the pharmacist must check each medication and countersign with his or her initials. Labels usually contain the same type of information regardless of the facility. All drugs must be labeled before they leave the pharmacy. The required parts of a label include the patient's name, medical record number and room number, name of the drug, strength of the medication, name of the solution with which the medication was mixed, and the rate of infusion. In several areas of a hospital, the pharmacy must maintain a par level of medications. Technician must recognize each of the abbreviations representing the units and clinics that require medications from the pharmacy. The supplies kept on hand in these units are referred to as floor stock. The technician must be fully aware of the types of medication used in each of these areas because each unit, ward, or clinic has its own special stock. Because of the special needs of each area, many pharmacies have special forms that are pre-printed with complete descriptions of commonly used drugs. This helps reduce the incidence of stock being sent to the wrong areas in the pharmacy, and the pharmacy normally receives the supply ordering forms from the specialty areas daily. Box 9.2 lists examples of primary units and areas that require medication from the pharmacy. So we have the coronary care unit, the ER, intensive care unit, labor and delivery, the neonatal intensive care unit, the nursery, oncology, the operating room, orthopedics units, urology, you name it. So crash carts, another important pharmacy task is the refilling of crash carts. These are trays used by all areas of the hospital. They contain injectable medications used for a code situation. Each hospital has a set of codes. It is the responsible of each employee to know the hospital code names. So most of the time it's like a code blue. So we, after a coding happens, we would go and retrieve the cart and refill it. So it's obviously going to be used again. So in refilling a crash cart, never assume that the unused drugs left inside the tray are correct. So there's going to be a specific list of things you keep in the crash cart at all times. Once you get the crash cart back from whatever unit it was at, you are going to basically do an audit of it. You're going to have, use a list or a sheet, however your hospital has it. And you're going to write down basically the inventory of what you have. And then you are going to add whatever is missing. But you want to make sure you're checking everything. So a prime example is the common error of failing to differentiate between pediatric and adult strengths of lidocaine. As another example, epinephrine is always stocked on a crash cart. Both adult and pediatric strengths are packaged in pre-filled syringes and they have a similar appearance. Note the dose of pediatric strength epinephrine is an order of magnitude different from adult strength epinephrine. Placing a Adult dose epinephrine into a pediatric tray is a common error. If that should occur, it could cause a death rather than save a life. Always remove all medications and start anew. Following the prepared list, check all the strengths of the medication and their expiration dates. So we have box 9.3. These are examples of hospital codes. So code, re code red is usually a fire. Code blue is a medical emergency for an adult. Um, code white apparently is a medical emergency for pediatric. I don't think that was what mine was at the hospital I worked at. I'm not sure. Um, code pink in the hospital I worked at was for um, an infant emergency or a birthing emergency. 
Um, they have codes for child abduction, bomb threat, um, combative persons. Oh, so I worked out that was a code green. Um, code silver is person with a weapon or a hostage situation. Um, code orange is usually a hazardous material spill release. Uh, table 9.3 lists commonly used medications on the crash carts and their classification. So you can read through those and see everything that's supposed to be in the crash cart. And this right here is an EMS box, another thing that we do in the pharmacy. Another area that stock supplies for the hospital is the central supply. Usually boxes of large volume IV preparations and mixtures are kept there in addition to dressings, tubing, and instruments used by various departments. The pharmacy orders stock normally on a daily basis from Central Supply. The type of stock ordered includes sterile water and various strengths of solutions, such as pre-made potassium chloride bags or lactated ringer solutions. The American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the ASHP, Pharmacy Practice Model Initiative recognizes pharmacy technicians as a cornerstone of the future of pharmacy practice. This initiative recommends increased educational requirements for technicians to prepare them for expanded roles and increased responsibility. The benefits of technician education are numerous. Technicians play an integral role in the institutional pharmacy practice. With continuing education, they become more engaged in their work, which leads to better accountability and greater job satisfaction.